Welcome everyone to uh, considerations for operating Docker scale in the Docker 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 track. Looks like folks are still kind of rolling in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to introduce Andrew and Sujay. Uh, Sujay's from uh, Java, uh, and Andrew's uh, one of Docker's own. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Romas. I'm a solution architect for Docker based out of Indianapolis. In my time at Docker, I've been involved in many large scale app transformations as well as successfully running Docker at scale. Today, I'm fortunate to be joined by Sujay from Jable. We'll let Sujay introduce himself, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks, everyone, for coming in. Um, my name is Sujay Pule. I work as a senior DevOps engineer for Jable. I'm also Docker captain and also the community leader for our local meetup group in Penang, Malaysia. When scaling Docker EE, there's many architectural considerations, such as what sort of infrastructure do I have available, where are my users, and how large should my clusters be? Node sizing is also important. In order to have the horsepower to successfully manage the cluster, as well as to support the application workloads that are going to be deployed on the cluster. I'll also touch on some orchestration best practices when running at scale and how to effectively scale applications. In terms of architectural considerations, it's important to design for failure. I'm sure we all know how nodes can go down in both on premise and in data center environments or in uh, cloud environments. Also, nodes can go down, network connectivity can be lost, and if you're really unfortunate, nodes can be vaporized. In terms of recently we launched Docker Certified Infrastructure, which is a set of tooling to manage and provision Docker EE clusters. We'll touch more on that later, um, but it's pretty neat. And when running at scale, how do you make sense of thousands of nodes and containers? This is where prioritizing centralized logging and metric collection is useful. By being able to collect, analyze, and distill that data, it's easy to make decisions for your cluster and your applications. The most basic way to scale a Docker EE cluster is a single logically separated cluster. As we talked about yesterday in the general session, by giving developers choice in terms of orchestrator, what sort of frameworks they use and tools, by having a single logically separated cluster, this allows people to deploy .NET applications to Windows environments, to use Kubernetes for new microservice deployments, or use Swarm. The way you, you can scale this kind of uh, architecture is by just adding more worker nodes, and then you can increase the capacity of the cluster. In terms of clusters by life cycle, uh, another common way to scale uh, Docker enterprise environments is by life cycle. Non-production environments have different load and security profiles than production. In production, security and high availability is the greatest concern, and in non-production, agility and flexibility will produce the greatest results. By allowing developers to be able to deploy and test their applications in non-production, this gives them the flexibility to really get their application changes um, in the non-production environments. When you're operating at scale, the impact of losing a cluster or availability is higher because there's so many applications that are running on these clusters. That's why it's important to have a DR strategy. Uh, one example here is with multi-region DR. Let's say you have an east and west data center. This is where the portability of Docker containers really shines. You can have your CI agent load up the client bundle for the East data center, in this case, uh, version 1.0. And the client bundle allows your CI agents to communicate to different clusters. You load in uh, certificates and environment variables so that it can communicate with the UCP cluster. So the same version will be deployed to the East and to the West by just loading in the West client bundle then. This keeps your uh, data centers in sync, and impact from losing availability now will not be as harsh as it was before. 
To expand on this topic, there's also the concept of blue-green platforms. In this example, a 1.0 release is deployed to the blue platform. This is the current production workload. Developers just finished a 1.1 release and it's deployed to an alternate URL on the green platform. This is where you run your smoke tests to ensure the new release is ready to go. You don't want to run load tests though in this environment. That should be done in pre-production environments because this will be using the production database. Now, using either weighted DNS entries or global load balancers, it's possible to increase the traffic to 10% on the new release. As the new traffic's running through, uh, this is where monitoring and metrics come into play. With centralized logging and metrics, now it's easy to find anomalies with the new release. Is memory profile out of whack? Uh, are there any exceptions that are caught? Uh, so this is the time to, you can actually kind of test the new release before cutting over all the traffic. So after you measure the new release and everything looks good, this is when this, you can cut over the rest of the traffic to the new release. Now maintenance can be for, performed on the blue cluster, or if your automation is strong enough or robust enough, this is when you can actually just rebuild the blue cluster to the latest release if you want to upgrade that way rather than in place. So recently we, we launched Docker Certified Infrastructure. This uses uh, Terraform and Ansible. How many people out there are familiar with Terraform? Okay, quite a bit. How about Ansible? Okay, great. For, for those of you that didn't raise your hands, I'll still go ahead and explain it. So Terraform is uh, infrastructure as code. This allows, allows for your um, infrastructure provisioning to be stored in source control. So it's easy to see what sort of changes were made and it's really easy to create repeatable clusters. With Docker certified infrastructure, uh, we, su we supply uh, Terraform and Ansible playbooks, uh, and it's supported by Docker. So in basically 25 minutes, it's possible to provision a fully HA Docker environment. And in this example, uh, there's 50 UCP Linux workers and 20 Windows workers. So this allows for uh, so it will basically build the cluster with this many, uh, with these specs. And then after the cluster's provision, it's possible to increase these numbers and run Ansible again, and then it will join in the new workers as well. So you can actually grow your cluster by using this tooling. As I mentioned earlier, node sizing is important. Uh, manager nodes, uh, it's important to have the proper resources available to manage the cluster. Four by 16 is really a good starting point. Uh, maybe more uh, for DTR if you're doing a lot of image pushes and pulls, so that you could have concurrent uh, image scanning jobs for security vulnerabilities. And since Raft is very I.O. heavy on the manager nodes, it's very important to mount SSDs to varlib docker so that there's no constraint in terms of uh, I.O. in managing the cluster. This configuration can support hundreds of worker nodes. In terms of uh, HA in this environment, three or five managers is preferred. Five has the advantage in that it can tolerate more failures. Seven, you really don't get too much gain and there's more infrastructure to manage, so three or five is usually a good starting point there. Now for sizing worker nodes, there's really no blanket statement of this is the, abs the size you should use. It really depends on the application workloads. So if you're migrating previous applications, uh, there'll be less overhead from the OS since in previous environments there's the OS tied with every app. In a containerized environment, it shares the kernel, so it's really just the process that you're migrating. So when you're migrating, migrating these applications, just take a look at the profiles in previous environments, and then as you move it over to non-production environments, uh, do some tests. Clusters are dynamic. They're uh, it's really easy to just add in more workers, resize workers, You're really not stuck with your initial decision. Just take your best guess, run some load, and then adjust from there. And it's also important to leave headroom for rescheduling events. So if a node is lost in your cluster, 
basically, all those containers will be distributed to other nodes in the cluster. So by leaving some additional headroom in the rest of the nodes in your cluster, this allows for that additional uh, rescheduling load. Now in terms of orchestration, some best practices are don't schedule workloads on manager nodes. Managers are very important. They, s they handle all the networking, orchestration, and that's the interface to the cluster. So there's a checkbox actually where you can enable that, or disable scheduling to manager nodes. And deploy to nodes that fit app profiles. Some nodes have high memory, CPU, or disk requirements. And by actually labeling nodes or constraining uh, those applications to those sorts of nodes, you can essentially create like mini clusters within your environment, and those applications can just be deployed to the nodes that fit their resource profiles. It's important to constrain resources. Uh, in a multi-tenant environment, one container that's just using up a bunch of memory can bring down the rest of the containers on a node. By using uh, resource constraints for every container that's deployed on the node, this will allow it to play within its bounds. So if it ha has a memory leak, only that container would be affected instead of the rest of the containers on that node. And then for Kubernetes, use namespaces with, uh, when dealing with multiple users and teams. Now, in terms of scaling applications, stateless applications scale the best. I think this goes without saying. Uh, since they don't have to deal with session state, you can really just increase the replica count and it can handle the additional load. Um, and with any orchestrator in Docker EE, it's really just a matter of adjusting the replica count and then uh, it will handle that additional load. And I think this is the most important point on this slide is understand the metrics by which to scale. Um, some applications are I.O. bound, CPU bound, or memory bound. Um, those are the sort of metrics that is important to understand with your centralized logging so that you can scale based upon uh, those, uh, those metrics that you gather so your applications can perform well uh, and support production workloads. And uh, well, thank you. Uh, now I'm going to kick it over to Sujay, who will talk about how Jabil operates at scale. Thanks, Andrew. Um, before I get started, I would like to introduce my company, Jabil, who we are and what business we are into. So Jebel was founded in 1966, and we have 100 plus sites in 29 different countries, and we have over 180,000 employees worldwide. So we provide electronic design, production, and product management services for companies in automotive, capital equipment, consumer lifestyle, and very wearable technologies, computing and storage, defense and aerospace, digital home, healthcare, mobility, networking and telecommunications, packaging, point of sale, and printing industry. We architect and orchestrate one of the complex supply chain around the globe. We serve around 250 plus brands in the world. Now, any developer within Jebel across the 100 plus sites what we have has a freedom to choose any technology or a platform stack to develop a system which would support our business. Now, we as a team IT find ourselves in the metrics from hell Considering the fact that we operate in such large scale and the different verticals we are into. So for those who are new to the term of metrics from hell, it is the challenge of packaging an application regardless of the language, framework, or technology so that it can be deployed onto any cloud regardless of the operating system infrastructure or hardware that it runs on. 
we had a goal uh, where we had to migrate this 80% of the workload onto the cloud in an efficient, secure, and cost-effective way. And now, when talking about containers, uh, there's no better option to consider other than Docker containers. So I would like to play a short video which demonstrates uh, one of the use cases what we have executed at a site called Wuxi in China. And this was recently uh, highlighted during the MS Build keynotes. People tend to think of JPL as a contract manufacturer. We are more than that. We're a manufacturing solutions provider. It's a very difficult business. We help customers with taking a product and building it at scale. We went to the production site and found out the test machines suffers very high false call, around 30%. Operators have approximately two seconds to analyze each one of these images. For some of the boards, they can have upwards of several thousand components on it. Human gets tired constantly staring at the same stuff. We thought that was a very good opportunity for us to use deep learning to classify images. The model is actually reducing the workload far better. For model training, we're using Azure Linux GPU VN, and we're using Azure Machine Learning Services to deploy the model as Docker container. Our pilot is predicting 75% of the past images and can correctly predict 92% of the defects. It's one of the most advanced predictive projects that we've had going on so far. We've been talking with Microsoft about Project Brainwave. The early test result from Microsoft has shown FPGA is capable of predicting 550 images a second, comparing with a CPU cluster with 40 images a second. The potential for Project Brainwave is substantial in allowing us to move forward at scale for machine learning across Jable. So isn't that cool? 550 images being processed in a second with Docker containers. So I would like to highlight how our journey began with Docker. Uh, like back in 2000, December 2016, we started our journey with Docker, uh, starting on with the community edition. So we set up a team we, who were enthusiastic to work along with te uh, container technologies. And we set up an environment on community edition, which had uh, 1.13 as the Docker engine first, and then upgraded to 1706. This environment was having like nine node clusters, of which we had five manager nodes and four worker nodes. We set up a Docker flow proxy, which is a customized version of HA proxy and provides on demand reconfiguration. We used ClusterFS as the storage for backend. And we also set up a standalone registry server and Portus as the web front end for it. And we used Portainer as the management solution for Docker and Theos for monitoring. So if you consider your containerization journey, it would fall in one of those buckets what you see on the fi figure right below. So either you may be getting started with your first project, or, sorry, getting started with Docker containers, or executing your first project, or trying to scale out things, what you have in your environment, or try to develop some cool innovative solution on top of Docker. Now, with all this uh, community edition, what we had set up, you, if you look up, we had to stitch together all the open source components what we had integrate, integrated. So what we did is that we prepared a business use case and uh, showed it to our business what values Docker EE can bring to us. And thus, in April 2018, we went live with our Docker EE environment. So what you see is uh, our current existing Docker EE environment which is a 10 node cluster running out of our Singapore data center in Microsoft Azure. So the top management plane, which is called the universal control plane, has three manager nodes, and the below are the worker nodes. 
of that we have two windows worker node and seven oh sorry five other linux worker nodes uh, the docker engine what we have on this is 76 with a ucp version of 2.2.6 and dtr 2.4.3 uh, we also have set up a cache server in the Europe region and one in US region. Uh, those are not highlighted in this diagram because it's running a community ed edition engine and that's not supported by Docker. So if you see on the right hand side, uh, the three worker nodes, what are there? are grouped under an availability set. And it sits behind a load balancer, which listens on that domain name over there. So these three, uh, these three virtual machines, which are grouped under the availability set, are the DTR replicas, what we have. I will explain you what is an availability set in one of the slides, which would be coming up next. So any user within Jabil who needs to push or pull images needs to contact to this domain name. The DTR also has the ability to cache images closer to the user so that it reduces the amount of bandwidth used during the Docker pools. Uh, the DTR also has a feature to clear up unreferenced manifests and the layers. Moving forward, if you see the management plane, which I call is the universal control plane, it has again three manager nodes grouped under availability set and sits behind a load balancer, which is an Azure L4 load balancer. And it's talking on the domain name ucp.docker.com. So the UCP is a centralized management plane where you can control all your resources, such as the nodes, the networks, the volumes, etc. You can also deploy, manage, and monitor application through UCP. So what we have done is that for the authentication part, it has an integration with our Active Directory, and there is a single sign-on between DTR and UCP. There's also a feature called role-based access control in, uh, in UCP, which allows you to grant granular per permissions for user control so that you can lay down restrictions so that there is a restriction on user what resources he can see or what resources he can view in the system. Similarly, if you go down the worker nodes, the Linux and the Windows worker node are again grouped under different availability set. And if you see the Linux worker node over there, again sits behind a load balancer and is configured on a wildcard domain. So what happens is that any application which is deployed through the UCP gets a dynamic domain name assigned to it according to the deployment template what you have and thus it gets deployed onto the Linux worker node. Now, as the Windows worker node, which is a Windows 2016 server, it doesn't support the routing mesh feature, which is available in Swarm. So what we do is that we use Swarm's publish port mode and to expose the port and access the application directly over there. So these are some of the application right now what we have deployed on Docker E. Uh, if you see clockwise, the first thing is what we call Pi Update System. Uh, it's a Linux-based container running a simple web application. But it also serves as a central repository for all the Raspberry Pi devices what we have deployed in our environment. So what is, it does is that uh, it hosts a Raspbian-based OS image which all the Raspberry Pi uh, checks at an interval of 30 minutes to find out whether there is a Raspbian OS update available or not. So that's kind of an automatic update done on all the Raspberry Pis on the production floor. 
and we do have also developed some customized uh, Raspberry Pi based images, or Docker images, which are listed over there. Uh, the second screenshot shown is like on the production floor, there are big screens which shows the line control status on a, as a kind of dashboard. So those are running also uh, small Raspberry Pi devices, which shows that web application or the web status in a Docker container. The third one is a .NET beta uh, based application. What we had deployed as the first .NET application in our environment after undergoing the MTA program with Docker. So like Andrew mentioned, uh, how could you achieve high availability in your system? So when you are uh, deploying your application on Microsoft Azure, you can group them into Azure skill set or availability set. So the main difference between a scale set and availability set is that uh, in a scale set, all the VMs what you group together should be identical, while in availability set, it may be different or same. And in scale set, there may be an unpredictable workload which may come and go, while in availability set, uh, the workloads are predictable. So in our case, like we just had three replicas of DTR and three manager nodes. So we group them into an availability set over there. So when you deploy those virtual machines in an availability set, uh, what happens is that your VM is assigned an update domain and a fault domain. A fault domain is defined as the group of VMs which share the common power source and network switch. And the update domain is used for VMs, patching of the VMs. And Azure takes care of it that only one update domain is patched at a time. Now, when you configure such VMs in an availability set, by default, there are two fault domains and five dom update domains assigned to the group. So in our case, like the region being Singapore, it's two and five in our case. It may differ according to region what is you have chosen for the deployment. Image caching. So as you see, our DTR uh, sits in a Singapore data center, and a user with, who is located at St. Pete's, our headquarters, or a user from the European region tries to pull a simple basic Alpine image. It takes around 20 seconds for the US user, while for the Europe user, it takes around 14 seconds. While if you try to do the same thing from a Docker hub, it takes around five seconds for you, depending on the bandwidth, what you are getting. So how could you reduce this uh, time taken to pull down the image? So what you do is that you deploy a cache server close to the user location. And in our case, we have a cache server, which is running community edition. And it sits near to the East Coast and one in the Europe region. So the time gets reduced to seven and five seconds, respectively. The other cool feature DTR provides is garbage collection. So using the garbage collection, uh, you can clean up unreferenced manifests and the image layers from the DTR storage so that the DTR storage consumption is reduced. Uh, there are three options available for you. Uh, one is until done. So it would execute the DTR garbage collection for a period of time until it gets connect, uh, cleaned up. So what happens is that when this job runs, uh, your DTR goes into a read-only mode, and the users can only pull images from your DTR instance. The second option is you execute it for a particular interval of time, so let's, let's say for X amount of minutes. So that gets, there's a 
second configuration available when you click on that you can schedule it as a cron job over there and it would execute the garbage collection for that minutes what is mentioned over there and in our case we are just getting started with it and our uh, storage is not that heavy right now so we have not enabled that in our environment so you have your docker e environment setup and the other cool feature which will be required first is how to monitor the solution what you have deployed so we make use of uh, microsoft provided uh, solution which is called microsoft operation management suit uh, it's a collection of management services that were designed in the cloud from the start so rather than deploying and managing on premise resources oms components are entirely de uh, deployed in azure so the configuration is just minimal and you can be up and running in minutes so the oms service basically consists of four pieces one is log analytics automation backup and site recovery so we have this configured in our environment and the it comes up with a clean dashboard something like this i'll just show you a small quick demo about this so how could you set up this in your environment so as andrew mentioned there is a screen which allows you to run run workloads on the manager as well as dtr replicas but he suggested that it shouldn't be done but there may be cases where you need to execute workloads on the manager node as well as dtr so in case of monitoring you need to collect those log metrics and other information from that host also so what you do is that go and check that option and click on the save and then you can use either the command line or the ucp console to start up a service so what i'm doing here is i'm creating a service in a global mode and using a microsoft provided oms image which is available on github and there are two secrets being used over there which is a workspace id and key so which helps to connect to the operation management suite what we have set up on azure so once this service comes up if you see in the between it shows 8 out of 10 replicas are running right now so the reason two services didn't come up is because that image which you used is a linux based image and we have two windows nodes on in our environment and that's the reason two services are missing over there I'd like to give you a quick overview of Microsoft Operation Management Suite, how it looks like. So right now I am logged into my azure dashboard and what you see is come up Oh, I remember now. I didn't worship the demo god.
do we have any other Wi-Fi to connect for speakers? Pooh. So those who are interested, I can show you the demo like at the lobby or somewhere we sit together and I can just show you the demo. Unfortunately, the internet is not good. So yeah, that's it from my side. And if you need more information on this, we have a last slide which gives you some links. So yeah, if you have any questions, any doubts about Azure, you can drop it to me and anything on e, Docker e, that's for Andrew. Yeah. <laughs>